Oh, it's 102. I said that's our start time. So let's go. So I'm um, good afternoon, everybody. And I'm really happy for um, the folks who are joining us for the second workshop. Um, it's good to see the whole bunch of people returning. Today, we're going to take a deeper dive into um, creating neurodivergent friendly youth programming. Um, and also today, we are welcoming not just CC educators, but we're also welcoming CCE volunteers. So I'm super happy about that, too. And um, I just, um, before we start, I just really want to thank Em for, again, for creating time to share her expertise and um, her time with us. I know that it's a little bit out of the ordinary for her day-to-day -day role. Em is a, a neurodivergent focused counselor and therapist with Cornell Health. And I appreciate so much her willingness to support the extension system and the extension educators. And I, um, I think that we always love to have the support of campus. And so thank you, Em, so much. And I guess I'm just going to if you um, just remind everybody, we're just doing intros in the chat just to say your name and what association you're uh, with. And I'm going to hand it over to Em. And here we go. Hey. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is share my screen um, so that we can uh, I can show you my PowerPoint. Um, we get that all set up. Um, so you should be seeing my first slide. Um, as uh, Susie said, I am an ADHDer um, and a therapist that focuses on ADHD. Um, I was trained as a mental health counselor through Alfred University. Um, uh, the picture of me as a little kid is me when I was diagnosed with ADHD. Um, so this is just to say that I come at uh, thinking about neurodiversity, both from a place of um, research and education, as well as really lived experience for most of my life. Um, okay. uh, today, we're going to briefly talk about uh, the language that we use around neurodivergence. We're going to talk about neurodivergent friendly spaces. And then we're going to talk about the um, core features of um, neurodivergence and ways that we can consider how we want to uh, plan programs for youth, um, keeping those things in mind. Um, this QR code here um, gets you a link to our PowerPoint. So if um, you want that, you want my um my notes that come with the slides, there's more information in those than we'll be able to cover today. So you are absolutely free to snap that up, um, use it however you would like. Um, okay, so we're in, uh, before I get into the neurodivergent friendly space, I do wanna make a quick note about the way that I use language. Um, neurodivergence is anybody that is uh, not neurotypical or not uh, has a brain that works in ways that we um, kind of don't build the world for. Um, and I generally use language like ADHD -er or um, uh, autistic individual rather than person with autism or person with ADHD because I find that it's it's part of our identity and really like uh, like me, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, having said that, let's jump in. So the first thing that I want to think about when we are talking about uh, making programming for neurodivergent folks or that is neurodivergent friendly is uh, examples of neurodivergent friendly spaces. Um, here on Cornell's campus, we have a sensory focus room. So these pictures are actually from the sensory focus room. We also have um, posters that we um, give to anybody that would like access to them that uh, delineates a space that is neurodivergent friendly. Um, there's also posters that you can like kind of self-identify. So in our offices here, um, we'll you'll often see people saying like proud ADHD -er, or neurodivergent and happy, that kind of stuff to kind of cue people in that this is a space that they can talk about that kind of stuff. Um, other things that I want us to be thinking about as we go through the that bulk of the presentation is identifying the barriers that may exist in terms of the types of symptoms and experiences people have and seeing what we can do to kind of proactively address those barriers, thinking about the clarity in cultural norms and communication and expectations, both in workplaces and in the programming that we use. Um, and then uh, I always like to note accommodations um, are often kind of a last resort when we're thinking about programming, right? Um, but they can be really useful to think about 
the way that people ask for uh, accommodations, most of the time you will hear something like, I'm ADHD and so X, right? Um, one of the things that I really try and support people in doing is actually flipping the script. And instead of saying, um, I'm ADHD and so I need X, instead saying this space or this thing is disabling me and here is how it's doing that. Um, so one example of that might be, um, you know, let's let's take the ramp example, right? Um, you could say, I'm in a wheelchair, so I can't go up these stairs. Or you can say, the fact that there is no ramp, the fact that there are no stairs is disabling me. Um, it's not that I am the problem, it's that the lack of ramp is a problem. And that happens in all sorts of things. Um, so as we're thinking about programming, as we're working with populations that may need to ask for accommodations, that's one of the things that I always like to try and kind of articulate if we can. So in terms of core features of um, neurodiversity, one of the big things is sensory experiences. Um, I'm not gonna get into all of the variety of sensory experiences. If you want some like, deep dive into um, what that might be or how the, the variety of experiences can be felt, um, please absolutely dig into these notes. There's a bunch of stuff in there. Um, but suffice to say that all of us exist on a spectrum of hyper and hypo awareness of our sensory experiences, our experiences in our body. So when we're thinking about programming, we wanna make sure that we have options for folks that are extra sensitive to sensations and that may be sensation seeking. So things to keep in mind, if you are hypersensitive to sound, you may want to have earplugs um, readily available for folks that may, may need that. Um, some people need a certain level of stimulation in order to be able to pay attention. So as you'll notice, like I am in a wheelie chair and I am spinning, right? So having access to something that allows you to fidget in a way that's not too distracting um, or being able to provide fidgets to the people that, that need to be in that space with you. Um, gloves can be really useful if we're doing things like gardening, cooking, cleaning, things where we have to touch stuff that even to those of us that do not have kind of extra sensory awareness, don't love touching, right? <laughs> if you have extra sensory awareness, that may be the difference between being able to engage in a task and completely having to shut down. Um, also, uh, timers, uh, we're gonna talk more about timers a little bit later, but um, timers are really, really useful for those of us that have difficulty with our sense of time, uh, may not be aware of time. Um, do be aware of the, the noise that your timer makes. Um, for some folks, the noise of the timer may cause um, really difficult sensory um, auditory kind of overstimulation. Um, so if you're using like a timer online, using one of those like gentle strumming noises instead of the rah, rah, rah kind of alarm might be uh, something to keep in mind too. In terms of emotions, similar to uh, the kind of variety of experiences we expect with our awareness of our body sensations, there's a variety of uh, awareness that we expect people uh, to be able to describe their uh, their own emotions or be aware of their own emotions. That goes everywhere from alexithymia, which is not having the words or ability to describe those emotions, to really, really overly intense emotions that may cycle rapidly or may be really difficult um, to, to control. Um, Obviously, we can't always attend to every person's emotion, especially while we're doing big programming uh, events, but we do wanna try and make a, a space safe for folks that may need to process their emotions differently. Um, generally, I think of this as being able to step away uh, when needed. Um, so articulating at the on onset that um, it's okay to step away if you need to. Um, using a two facilitator model can be really helpful here to allow someone to go check on anybody that needs to be, uh, that needs to step away or needs to self-regulate. Um, and then also allowing if, if we have, you know, like a sensory safe space available, um, that's even better, right? Like a designated space to step away. Um, additionally, um, it's also a really good opportunity if it's a smaller uh, group of folks, um, a smaller group of participants to um, uh, practice self-regulating as a group or 
teaching ground some basic grounding techniques that can be helpful. Um, uh, communication becomes one of the big areas that we deal with, especially as folks do it. Um, and there's a lot of different ways that, that communication issues or uh, miscommunications can happen, right? Neurodivergent communication can just be different. That's totally okay. We may notice things like um, echolalia, which is like really repeating um, directly what people are saying, or maybe some of the kind of more nonverbals, right? Um, I'm being very expressive. A lot of uh, neurodivergent folks find this to take a lot of effort out of them, and so may not be able to express in the same way, maybe kind of monotone verbally or monotone face wise. Um, so having being really clear and explicit about our communication is is needed, right? So that can be um, being explicit about the social expectations and rules of this programming setting. That can also be um, being really clear and explicit about what people are supposed to do. So oftentimes when we get to, um, even when we get to like a, a Q and A time, we have this moment where everybody kind of like sits and looks at each other and you're kind of hoping that somebody has a thought, right? Even in those moments, a lot of neurodivergent folks may have questions, but haven't been explicitly told that now is the time to ask questions. Uh, so having even that kind of explicit thing or saying like, all right, we did all of the like free prep time. Now let's go ahead and do it. Come walk with me to the next section, right? Can be really needed for some neurodivergent folks. Um, rules can't be assumed. Uh, they, they have to have a reason. That reason has to be explained and must be explained by something that isn't because I said so. Um, obviously, we're talking about programming with teens. So I'm guessing that's already a baseline, right? Like how many teens do you know that really want to follow rules without at least a little bit of pushback? Um, so having um, not only that reason behind it, but being really willing to say it. I think a lot of times when we work with teens, especially when we've had a long day, we just want to be like, all right, I know you're sassing me, but can we like move on? Um, a lot of times our neurodivergent teens may seem like they're sassing us, but actually are trying to get the answer. They, they actually don't know. Um, so kind of keeping that in mind can be really helpful. Uh, similarly, some social conventions, including like some politeness expectations may be really confusing for neurodivergent folks. Um, some of the, the ones that I see a lot are uh, knowing exactly how to say hello when you come in. I, th I know that's also kind of common for, for adolescents as well. They're kind of navigating that for the first time. Um, but even kind of explicitly like taking that off of their responsibility and saying hello to them instead of expecting them to say it to us can be one of those really baseline things that can make it easier for neurodivergent people to engage. Another really good example of this is knowing what to do when a social situation has ended. Um, I'm from the Midwest. There's this thing in the Midwest that's we call the Midwest goodbye, where you get stuck at the door. You're like, you're saying goodbye over and over again. And you just end up staying there for like half an hour because you just can't tear yourself away. I think this happens sometimes in uh, other contexts too. I know uh, my dad's family is from the East Coast and they're Italian and, and it's kind of similar thing happens there. But that's the social convention. A lot of neurodivergent folks don't know when to leave. So to me, it feels really similar when a neurodivergent person is in my space and doesn't know when to leave as when I'm doing a, a Midwest goodbye because it's it is very stalemated and it's very like, okay, is it now? Is it now? Um, that's the type of social conventions that may not be quite as clear um, to, to neurodivergent folks. And honestly, even to non-neurodivergent folks, to neurotypical folks, some of that stuff can be hard, right? Um, so being explicit about some of that is, it can be really helpful. Um, additionally, with uh, neurodivergence, especially with folks that are autistic, you wanna be careful how you're asking questions and um, and how or what type of responses you may be expecting. Um, so for example, open-ended questions, how are you feeling, to be an example of an open-ended question, can be really hard for some neurodivergent folks because they don't know what you're actually asking. Are you asking, how am I physically feeling? Are you asking, how am I mentally feeling? Um, are you asking about the weather? Uh, am I feeling about like how the weather is right now? Instead, you may want to, um, you can always start with an open-ended question, but you may want to close that question a little bit 
Um, sometimes folks that are neurodivergent need it to be as close as your yes or no. Are you having a good day today? Yes or no? Um, or tell me one specific thing. Um, I've had neurodivergent folks where I've asked a question like, um, what would your, what do you think your mother would say about this? And they would, and the response I often get is, well, I'm not my mom, so I'm, I don't know how to answer that. That's an example of the way that the, our processing might be a little bit different. They can't, this particular person couldn't put themselves in the shoes of their parent to be able to answer a question like that. So if you're getting responses that seem a little bit odd or seem a little bit off, or even they can't respond, a lot of ADHD folks will, for example, just say like, I don't know, to some questions that seem really basic, then you may need to adjust how you're asking that question. All right, one of the more difficult things for programming is thinking about executive dysfunctions. So executive dysfunctions are anything in the category of like prioritizing, planning, organizing, time management, um, all or nothing thinking, uh, memory difficulties, all of that's executive functioning and dysfunctioning. So with programming, the stuff that we kind of want to keep in mind uh, universally are things like using a timer. Um, for uh, in particular, I really prefer visual timers for folks with neurodivergence. Um, I've got an image here of one of my favorite timers. It's by it's called a time timer. Um, that blue space will actually go down as time goes down. That's how we um, consider it to be a visual timer. It's also flipped from most like typical egg timers um, to show uh, the idea is that um, when you use, so this is a typical timer, when you use one of these, the time is going this way, which is not the way that time goes on a clock. Um, so it kind of, you have to pay more attention to that versus if the shade was going the other direction, that's the way that time normally moves when you're looking at a, a regular physical clock. And of course, I set that timer to go off at some point during uh, our presentation, so I apologize. Um, <laughs> Uh, so these are these ones are specifically made with neurodivergent folks in mind because we know that um, the way that neurodivergent folks process time can be a little bit differently. So having to like do that kind of recalculation um, with a typical timer can be hard for folks. Um, additionally, you might want to think about things like uh, built-in breaks, built-in check-ins, um, time to ask, are you understanding what I'm saying? Um, breaks can also be kind of a double-edged sword, uh, depending on the type of neurodivergence and the way that folks have been managing their neuro neurodivergence. I think last time I did the, a presentation like this, I shared that um, it took me about a decade to train myself out of um, needing to be still during breaks. If if people would give us a break to get up and move around, or sometimes even ask us to do like jumping jacks to get our, our blood moving, I actually couldn't do that because if I engaged in that, I would not be able to get myself back into the activity. So that's the other thing to, to think about when you're doing breaks is, is it something that, you know, is this a person that may struggle to get back into the activity or not? Um, routines, um, if, if they are really, really helpful for executive dysfunction. So if you're doing programming that is like every week, having a specific routine in terms of the structure can be really useful, um, especially for, keeping some of that memory uh, in place. In fact, we know that um, students who take exams in the exact same seat that they took the notes for the class are more likely to have, a, or tend to have a better grade than kids that take it in another room or in a, another seat in that class. Our memory can, is very about based in routines, very based in the physical. So anything we can do to kind of uh, use that externalized part of, of a routine to help our memory difficulties is really ideal. Um, in terms of like the mental flexibility, all or nothing thinking stuff, a lot of neurodivergent folks really struggle with feeling like everything is either really awesome or really terrible. So with programming, especially with teens, um, we want to do as much uh, challenging of that in a non-judgmental way as we can. Um, so doing it in the moment is really, really useful, really helpful. Um, with that, we may also want to work on like identifying barriers or sticking points. Um, a lot of this like all or nothing thinking comes out of feeling like um, 
everything is fine until you hit a wall or a barrier of some sort and everything falls apart. Part of that happens because the way that the neurodivergent brain works is that we don't always consider what barriers might exist unless someone points them out. Um, so it's really easy to feel like any minuscule thing that's popped up just means everything's horrible because you didn't plan for it. You didn't know what you were going to do for that. So helping um, people kind of identify those kinds of barriers in the moment um, or that may happen at, in a more prolonged project that you may be working on with them can be really helpful. Um, additionally, uh, a lot of neurodivergent folks really struggle with um, having any sort of space between the thought and the action. So thinking of like impulsive choices, right? Um, for example, one of my friends, uh, her little brother had really severe ADHD. And at one point in high school, absolutely shredded a pair of pants that he was wearing because he just had the thought of what does it feel like if I tear this? And he couldn't stop himself from doing that action. Um, some medications will help with this. It, it, um, however, when we're doing programming with teens and when we're thinking about neurodivergent stuff, we may want to do what we can to help slow that process down. Um, sometimes it's literally looking at them as they're shredding their jeans and going, why are we doing this, right? Especially with teens, they respond pretty well to that, right? Um, but that kind of thing can be really helpful um, to, to sh also teach them that they can do that for themselves later on. All right. Uh, motivation is one of the more difficult things with neurodivergence. Uh, a lot of neurodivergent folks need motivation in order to complete tasks. There is no forcing themselves through it the way that, that a lot of neurotypicals can. So with that in mind, uh, in terms of programming, one of the things we want to do is help, you know, kind of increase motivation so that they will engage with us, right? Um, there's a couple ways we want to do this. Um, one is that is really, really easy and useful is harnessing a special interest, right? So if somebody uh, is really into frogs, for example, and you're trying to get them to engage in, um, you know, a gardening project, maybe what we want to do is plan a garden that will attract frogs, right? Um, so we're harnessing that special interest to get them interested in the thing that we're actually trying to work on them, work on with them. Um, special interest being something that they are really, really into. Sometimes that cycles, sometimes it's a more prolonged thing. Um, other things we may want to do is like gamifying uh, on fun or long tasks. Um, think about if you've ever had like little, little kids that you've tried to get them to like clean up something that they played with um, and you give them the option of like timing them while they do it, that's gamifying. They're racing each other to clean it up now. You've made it fun. You've made it a, a, a game, a task to do in a different way. Um, you want to you think about uh, creating rewards. Um, rewards can be hit or miss. Some, uh, a lot of neurodivergent folks are like, yeah, I could take it or leave it. Um, other neurodivergent folks really thrive on rewards. Um, the thing here is that it needs to be timely. So thinking about, you know, I mentioned earlier that a lot of neurodivergent folks have a really um, difficult sense of time. If the reward seems too far away from the task itself, then the reward is worthless. So think about um, if you said like, I'm going to get you ice cream if you get an A this quarter in class. That's too far away. Um, they That doesn't really exist to them. Instead, it could be if you do your homework, you'll get five minutes of TV time. Five minutes is probably not enough TV time, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Something that's much more timely uh, on what we're doing at the, on, on the moment. Um, doing something fun at the same time as something boring can also be really helpful. So for example, playing music that you like while you're doing something that you don't like. Um, again, here we want to think about um, the sensory experiences, right? Some people will thrive on that and some people won't be able to do um, things at the same time. So this is a kind of an individualized option. Um, and then uh, really, really important is establishing what done looks like. Um, a lot of ADHDers, a lot of autistic individuals can get really stuck in a task and they can feel like they can't stop until they finished it. 
but they haven't always articulated what finished looks like. So uh, one example is homework, right? Um, in high school, we're very lucky that a lot of our homework is like a worksheet or a set of math problems or a chapter to read. That is very easily concrete done. However, let's say you aren't um, going to get that whole sheet of um, math problems done, but you wanna get some of it done. You have to define how much you're gonna try and do or else that goalpost keeps moving, right? Um, I finished one problem, but I'm still kind of stuck. Let me, I'll just keep going until I feel like I'm done. And now suddenly I've done the whole worksheet and I'm very, very, very tired because I can't, because I couldn't stop myself when I needed to. Um, so articulating, helping them articulate what's done can be really helpful or um, articulating to them, especially in, you know, kind of a programming sense, if you have a specific activity that you're doing. Uh, I've got some general resources for you. Um, that can be really helpful. I've also uh, threw in my slide on diagnosis and treatment. If you're working with folks that are interested in that, there's some more resources in the um, in the notes of that section. Um, and I'm happy to add, answer any questions about that as well. Um, but I'm gonna stop share now so we can kind of, I can look at you guys um, and answer any questions. We can always go back to the slides if people have a specific thing they wanna look at on the slides as well. Um, but especially with programming, uh, I think it's really helpful to do more individualized stuff because I don't know what programs you guys are all running. Erica. One of the things that we do um, with SnapEd is we, we do a lot of brain breaks with both kids and with adults. Um, and we, we talk about with teachers and with their classes how brain breaks can be beneficial, especially uh, to help with executive dysfunction. Um, and I'm hearing you say that it can be hard to take those breaks and then refocus afterwards. So do you have any suggestions for how we can marry those two concepts where we're allowing kids to be, kids and adults actually, how we, are, we can allow them to be up and moving and getting the benefits of being active and also bringing them back to be able to refocus. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that can be really hard for a lot of neurodivergent folks is transition. Um, transition is a, a big time where we can kind of lose focus or where we um, can kind of forget what we're trying to be doing. Um, where we can help when we're doing the programming is um, dictating that transition time. So in the example of taking a brain break, you've articulated exactly what you want them to be doing, take some time, go move your body or sit and like give your brain a rest. Um, the next step is articulating how we're gonna get back into the activity that we're doing. Um, so for some folks that are like some kids that are like jumping around, running around, we kind of do this naturally when we, we say to them like, hey, come here, come sit back down. Like let's take some calming breaths. Um, but sometimes we get like so into what we're doing that we forget to say like, hey, let's do those calming breaths. Um, similarly, the other way that we can start getting them back into it is asking them to help us summarize what we were doing before. Some kids are gonna be able to do that, some kids aren't, right? That gets back into that open question thing that I was talking about earlier. But even the kids that aren't gonna be able to articulate it are gonna be able to hear another kid um, giving that summary or you kind of summarizing the kid's summary, right? And that can help get them back into the activity that they're doing um, or that we have next. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Of Seems like we have a quiet group this this one. Yeah. I can keep asking questions. Um, <laughs> I will keep answering them. <laughs> um I've had some groups uh in schools where they're putting together 
students with different types of neurodivergent situations. And sometimes the neurodivergent situations are almost like in direct conflict with each other and that can make it even more especially challenging. Like some kids are over stimulated with a lot of say sound and then you have other kids that don't stop making sounds. And um, it seems like that is almost like a counterproductive environment for everybody involved. Um, can you speak to any strategies around how to manage that or, you know, any classroom management techniques? For yeah, situation? absolutely. I think that that is so unfortunately so common. <laughs> um, I think it's, and especially as, um, you know, there's so many like um, integrative classrooms now, which is excellent for a lot of really wonderful reasons, but can also be really distracting for some folks that, that need to, to reduce stimulation. Um, there are some things that I would think about um, in terms of classroom management and, and physically setting up the classroom, creating different spaces can be really helpful. So having a space that is for folks that are um, like sensory avoidant or need less sensation um, so that they have somewhere to go to, um, to be away from that sound um, or away from that, you know, one of the things that always gets me is I, uh, is is visual stuff. So like at one point when I was in college, I had a professor that was that would pace the entire um, lecture and I would have to like stare straight down at my notes or else I, I was gone. I couldn't focus. Um, so having something that, some space that is somehow cordoned off, even if it's not, you know, obviously in a classroom, we can't necessarily put up like dividers, um, but having a space where they can know like, okay, I'm going to look at the, the corner here instead of back at the, the rest of the classroom can be sometimes enough to kind of reduce that simulation. Sound is a really hard one because there's only so much we can do, right? Um, obviously, when with older folks or older kids, um, you can do stuff like allowing kids to listen to music with their own headphones instead of like putting a mu music on for the entire classroom. But the kids that are like always clicking their pencil because they need to be moving at least a little bit, um, or the kids that aren't aware that they're making the same noise over and over and over and over again, um, there's not much we can do there. Um, some, obviously, like earplugs or over-the-ear uh, uh, noise-canceling headphones can be really helpful there, but not everybody is able to use those. Um, some people sensory-wise, like having that over their ears is really painful or difficult. Um, so, being able to like take as many of those breaks as possible um, would be kind of the recommendation that I would uh, have, even if that is like go for a walk outside the classroom, if you have an aide that can take them um, or be kind of in that corner in your sensory, um, reduced sensory environment thing. Yeah, I hope that helps a little bit at least. Thank you. Anyone else have questions or thoughts? Uh, I know I, I like focus more on interventions in this uh, conversation than I, uh, than the kind of 101 basic stuff. Um, if there's any of that stuff that people would also like me to like go back and, and do a little deeper dive on, I'm happy to do that as well. I know that Em, last time I shared with the previous group your slides, um, but I could share that with this group as well. So they have both sets of slides, which the one that does dive a little bit deeper into, as you just said, and then this set as well. And I saw you said in the chat that if you send it to me, I'll send it out to all the registration. Yes, registration. absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, I got a, a private message here too that is asking if I can speak a little bit more about neurodiversity in the workplace and how to advocate for ourselves. Um, I would love to talk about that. I think that's a really useful conversation um, to or conversation we could have in here too. Um, the the first thing I would I would um, say is doing that flipping the script is really helpful. Um, 
Additionally, one of the resources that I've uh, put in there is Ask Jan, which goes through, um, uh, it's the Disability uh, Accommodations Network, Job job Accommodations Network, something like that. Um, and they have all the types of stuff that we can get accommodations for legally in the US and gives examples of the type of accommodations that you can ask for. Um, they also have a bunch of volunteers that you can call and um, or email with or message with um, that will um, help you through your individual situation of how to ask for accommodations and how to have that conversation with a superior. Um, what I find to be most helpful is figuring out how feels comfortable for you to talk about your own experience. Um, obviously, like I said, I was diagnosed when I was in second grade. I have been screaming about ADHD from the rooftops since I was in about second grade. Um, I was really lucky that I was not raised in a home with stigma, that um, my parents really said like, hey, your brain is just wired differently. So there's going to be some things that other people get that you don't. And there's going to be some things that you get and other people don't. Um, so I've never felt a lot of difficulty doing that other than when I say something to um, a superior and ask for an accommodation and they don't really understand what, what the problem that I'm having is. Um, sometimes that can be the, the sticking point. Um, so in terms of ways to go forward, uh, figuring out kind of what the issue is that needs to be addressed, um, having a couple of different options of here's how we could address this and kind of cueing them in as an ally. Um, so it's uh, kind of like saying like, when you start the conversation saying like, I know you want to make sure that I am as effective as I can be. And here is a sticking point that I found, or here's an issue that I've noticed that's making it so that I can't be as effective as I need to be. So um, for example, one of the most helpful accommodations for, for me is carpooling. Um, I will not be on time to work if I don't carpool with somebody else because I just cannot get myself into the right timeline to get to work on time. But carpooling allows me to not have to worry about that. Um, whether I'm the one driving or the other person is the one driving, it allows me to, to get to work on time. So asking, you know, this situation is a little different because I'm asking somebody else to carpool than asking the boss. Um, but one of the things I had to do because I'm carpooling is adjust my work schedule. Um, and so I had to ask my boss, you know, hey, I need to get out half an hour early because I'm coming in half an hour early or because I, um, and I will make that time up elsewhere. I'm, I'm going to take a shorter lunch, whatever. Uh, and what I, what I did was say like, hey, if I drive myself, I will 100% be half an hour late to work every day. It's just going to happen. If I can continue carpooling, I need to get out half an hour early. But what I can do is either I can take a shorter lunch or um, I can come in a little early because I'm going to be here anyway. So I don't mind clocking in early. Um, can you help me make sure that that I that this works for us um, as an agency or as where I work? Because I want to be effective and I don't want to feel bad coming into work an hour late. Um, but that's where I'm at. Um, and usually I find that when when um, the conversation is more around um, uh, how it can be more uh, how they can help um, more successfully. Um, yeah. Um, the other thing to consider in those situations is how the environment itself is disabling, right? Um, some spaces uh, are naturally more friendly to neurodivergent folks. I often say like uh, one of the, my favorite examples is, is Zoom itself. Um, so a lot of people really don't want us to be having a bunch of meetings on Zoom anymore. They want us to be meeting in person all the time, which is great and has a lot of benefits. But one of the things that Zoom really does for ADHDers is allow us to fidget. Um, you, I'm not as distracting in a Zoom office, a Zoom screen when I'm just moving like this than if you were in my office watching me move like that and then watching me fidget um, and then like watching me do it with my hair tie that I'm using to fidget with. Um, similarly, a lot of um, neurodivergent folks like having their camera off because they don't have to express as, uh, you know, visually. Um, so that's 
the other thing with like creating neurodivergent friendly workplaces is kind of identifying what things might be uh, easier for some neurodivergent folks and, and what benefit that has um, to just allowing that to be a normal part of the way we engage. I hope that is in any way helpful to folks uh, out there. <laughs> I think it's such an important part of the conversation because it's not just the participants that we're working with, right? It's us and our colleagues and all of us together in order to be effective in our work. So I'm glad for whomever asked the question. While folks are stewing on that, I'm just going to put a link to our survey in the chat. So um, we are interested in your feedback. I guess if there aren't any further questions, um, I will certainly be sending an email to everyone with um, so the recording of this uh, workshop and the slides that I promised and another link to the survey. And um, Em, I don't know if you have any final thoughts you wanna share. No, uh, reach out if you have further questions, if, you, if it would benefit you to, to chat one-on-one, -on -one. Um, definitely available and willing. Um, and thank you guys for coming. Thank you guys for the questions that you did ask. Um, hopefully this was helpful in some way. Um, I think it definitely was. And I want to thank you again. Thank you again for your time and your expertise. Mm -hmm.